Hello there, this is Rio Darwell. I'm the leader of the humanities team here at Hamilton Education, and today we'll be reviewing the College Board's Digital SAT 393. We'll be starting with the first module, going through every single question and determining what is the best answer, why the wrong answers are wrong, I'm doing a little bit of approach rather than just explaining what exactly the answers are. So we'll get into it starting now. Okay, for our second question here, we have another vocab question here in module one. Again, our approach is to find what word we would want to put in the underlined portion to fit the context of the sentence. And then we're going to see which of these options they give us most aligns with what we would choose for that underlined portion. Like other tribal nations, the Muskegee Creek Nation is self-governing. Its national council generates laws regulating aspects of community life, such as land use and health care. While the principal chief and cabinet officials blank those laws by devising policies, administering services in accordance with them. Okay. So again, it's always important to know what the paragraph is saying. So what is this paragraph saying? That the Muskegee nation is like any nation. Um, and they generate laws and then impose those laws or make those laws work. They make a manifest in the world, right? So we're looking for a word like instill or enact or, you know, make real, okay? So our first answer choice, implement, is honestly the word I wanted to say the whole time, but didn't want to say just to give it away directly, right? Implement is exactly the kind of word we're looking for here. Implement meaning you take something and you put it into action. That's what the word implement means. Um, it can also, of course, mean a tool, but in this case, it means taking something and putting it in the real world. Presume is along the lines of assumption. Okay, so that word doesn't work. That's not meaning to turn it into the real world. Improvise is not exactly an opposite distractor, but not exactly what we're looking for. Um, improvise being to do something without any kind of rigid stricture, right? Um, improvise means kind of come up with something as it's going on, make it up as you go along. That isn't what works here either. We're looking for something kind of structured. And mimic means to imitate. Um, they're not imitating those laws. They're putting those laws in the real world, okay? So we will go with implement. All right, so here we are looking at our first question. Uh, the first set of questions in our first module are always going to be vocabulary. So let's look at question one. When Mexican-American archaeologist Zelia Maria Magdalena Natal published her 1886 research paper on sculptures found at the ancient indigenous city of Teotihuacan in present-day Mexico, other researchers readily did some sort of response. They had some sort of response or consideration. Her work as groundbreaking. Obviously, it'll be in the past tense. This recognition stemmed from her convincing demonstration that the sculptures were much older than had previously been thought. All right, so we see convincing demonstration here. We see this recognition. With these vocab questions, very often we have a synonym. We have something that says this blank. This here, recognition. That word is going to be relatively synonymous. It's going to give a clue as to what our underlined word should be. So another perspective I would like for us to take is, what word would I put in this underlined portion to make this sentence work? I'm looking for something along the lines of saw, S-A-W. Other researchers readily saw her work as groundbreaking. Okay, so now let's go through our answer choices. So 
acknowledged and saw are very similar, right? Acknowledged is to mean that, you know, we agree that something is there, right? Insured doesn't really work here. Um, her work could be insured as groundbreaking based off of what qualities it had, but these other people are not readily insuring her work. Denied is an opposite. Everybody seems to be agreeing that it was really convincing. To deny it would be to say the opposite. And then underestimated is also an opposite distractor. So I want us thinking of what word would go in this underlined portion and then going to our answer choices and determining which answer is most similar to that thing we natively came up with. Why? That's how we avoid opposite distractors. If you miss this, you're liking, pick, likely picking something that maybe you inverted what the meaning of this paragraph was. Okay, so question three of our module one here, another vocab question, is a really great vocab question. This is the kind of one that I'm thinking is a difficult vocab question, and here's why. Many of the answer choices that we are given have more than one specific definition or more than one connotation. Connotation is always what we're looking to consider when we're in vocab um, on these word, com these sentence completion sentences, questions. Um, we'll see in particular why I think this is a difficult yet really good question. In the indigenous intercropping system known as the Three Sisters, Maize, squash, and beans form some sort of web of relations, okay? Then we have the colon. That colon is telling us whatever comes after it is going to describe what the web of relations is, okay? So it's going to provide some sort of definition or synonym for what that underlined missing area will be. Maize provides the structure on which the bean vines grow. Squash vines cover the soil, discouraging competition from weeds. And the beans aid their two sisters by enriching the soil with essential nitrogen. Which choice completes the text? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we are looking for something that shows that there is this interconnected web of relations in which each thing provides something for something else. So... Interconnected is the word that we would want to find that's most similar to that. So we have indecipherable, ornamental, obscure, and intricate. At first glance, many of these words have very similar definitions. Indecipherable means uh, incapable of understanding, right? A language that is indecipherable is something that we, we have no way of learning what the language means. Ornamental uh, is probably the most different of these, but it basically is something that is just for appearance, right? Um, you know, the things behind me are ornamental. Actually, though, these are real candles. But, uh, obscure is something that, similar to indecipherable, is hard to understand, right? Um, and, uh, if your vision is obscured, you're not able to see all the way, something is impeding your vision. Um, sometimes obscure also has a connotation of being kind of like esoteric, which also means not super common, right? If you have obscure music choices, you're listening to things that not a lot of other people listen to. And then finally we have intricate. And intricate is interesting because this word sometimes can mean something like ornamental. One of the connotations of an intricate thing is where it's, you know, kind of a little bit showy. It also, intricate, can mean something along the lines of indecipherable in a connotation, right? Like, oh, that's a really, you know, intricate explanation might mean it's really long and unwieldy. But the real, most important, most common connotation and meaning of intricate is interconnected, right? Interconnected and com complex, 
Okay. So if indecipherable sometimes has a connotation of complex and intricate sometimes has a connotation of complex, what is the difference? Intricate requires the idea of interconnected things, right? And interconnectedness in the, the, the whatever that it is describing. So in this case, the web of relations is intricate because we have multiple different you know, objects in a particular type of relationship. So that's why we would go with D. Okay, so with question four here on module one of 393, we have another vocab question. And again, I'm looking for us to find a synonym somewhere or an antonym. And I'm also looking for us to find a word that we would want to put in this underlined portion before we directly engage with our answer choices. So first things first, this comma is unnecessary. So the college board has that there that doesn't need to be there. Um, kind of bizarre on their part, but hopefully that didn't throw you off. The artisans of the Igan Erinwan Guild in Benin City, Nigeria, typically blank so re react somehow to the bronze and brass casting techniques that have been passed down through their family since the 13th century. But they don't strictly observe every tradition. Um, for example, guild members now use air conditioning motors instead of handheld bellows to help heat their forges. All right. Um, so we're looking with, so let's get rid of some of these that, that don't work, okay? We're looking for something that means follow these techniques. <laughs> so this is a really important part of this, but they don't strictly observe every tradition. So experiment with goes with that portion, okay? This part from but to forges is experimenting. But what we're saying is that this first part is the non-experimental portion, right? Typically, they just follow it, but sometimes they experiment. So we're looking for just follow. That's why we can get rid of experiment with and improve on. Okay, both of these go with the second part of this passage, but do not fit the first part, which builds this kind of logical, normally this, but sometimes that, okay? So now we're looking which word means more to, means more, it more likely means follow, okay, or stick to. That would be adhere to. Adhere means to stick, all right? Um, if, you know, glue is an adherent, okay? Grapple with means to fight. You maybe have heard of grappling as a thing in MMA or wrestling or what have you. So that is how we get to adhere to. Okay, here we are on question five, module one of test 393. Another vocab question looking for a synonym, an antonym, or some sort of definition coming and it, later in the passage and looking for some sort of our, some word of our own to put in that underlined portion there. Some economic historians have blank that late 19th and early 20th century households in the United States experienced an economy of scale when it came to food purchases. They assumed, there we go, there's our word that we're looking for, assumed, that large households spent less on food per person than did small households. Economist Trevor Logan, however, showed that a close look at the available data disproves this supposition. Okay, supposition, assumption, etc. We are looking for a word that means that. Okay. And we are looking to get rid of words that don't mean supposition or assumption. Does regretted mean assumption or supposition? No. Does questioned mean supposition or assumption? No. Does contrived mean that? Well, we might not know what contrived means. Contrived is to kind of force something. Okay. Um, if the kid who, you know, 
always is kind of dressed like a nerd who goes to school every day, you know, in sweatpants suddenly shows up one day, like when one of those like big pants fits, you know, like whatever, like that's contrived, you're kind of putting it on, forcing it. Right. Um, you know, people from San Diego who like country music that's contrived. Right. Um, unless you're from where I'm from lakeside, then it's not contrived then it's allowed. Not if you're from, you know, 4S Ranch though, not allowed. Um, contrived, okay. So surmised is our only word that we cannot get rid of, right? It's the only word that we know. It, it, all of the other words we do know don't mean assumed or supposed, okay? So even if we don't know what surmised means, we should be selecting it in this case. However, we might be worried about selecting a word that we don't know. But if we can get rid of contrived, questioned, and regretted, we're fine. What does surmised mean? Means to kind of come to a conclusion based off of uh, assumptions. Okay, so it's exactly what we're looking for here. For five. Okay, so for question six, module one, 393, we are looking for a word that would fit this underlined area, this missing gap, based off of, as we see a colon here, what comes after. So, the work of Kiowa painter T.C. Cannon derives its power in part from the tension among its some sort of influences. Now it lists the influences. Classic European portraiture with its realistic treatment of faces. The American pop art movement with its vivid colors. And flat style, the intertribal painting style that rejects the effect of depth typically achieved through shading and perspective. Okay, so we have three things which are very different influences. If I'm looking for a word that I would pick here, that's a simple word, everyday word, I would maybe put among his different or contrasting influences, right? Um, influences that are very unique from one another. They don't typically go together. That's the word, that's the meaning I'm trying to convey here. So let's get rid of words that do not have that meaning. Interchangeable means that they can all be switched out. They're all kind of the same. The same way that aquamarine and teal and turquoise are all relatively interchangeable. But these are all kind of opposites, right? So we can get rid of interchangeable. Complementary we can get rid of as well. Okay, complementary influences are ones that go well together typically, right? Um, you know, the, the, the way that... Um, you know, there's there's complementary flavors or complementary colors, right? You you put yellow and blue together; it always looks nice. Okay, so complementary isn't what we have here either, because these are very distinct, different sort of contrasting influences. And finally, unknown. That's just pretty irrelevant, right? Unknown influences. How could that be correct when we then list his influences? If we're listing the influences, they're certainly not unknown, right? If you don't know these influences, it doesn't mean that they aren't known generally. Because they are listed, they are known. Therefore, without even knowing what it means at the moment, we can go with disparate. What does disparate mean? It means unique and different or distinct, coming from a bunch of different places, right? So... Um, there's a bit of a connotation of contrast and coming from far apart. So disparate is perfect in this example. But even if we don't know what that definition is, we should know what complementary, unknown, and interchangeable are. And if you don't, you have some time to think inter, meaning like interstate, across different places, changeable, well, like moving around. You can move things around and they can all be in the same spot. Complementary, you don't know what that is. You can think about complementary angles, et cetera, okay? Okay, with seven here, I'm sure that a lot of students have missed seven. Why? Well, because these are all the hardest vocab words on the test, let's be honest, okay? Or at least on module one. Um, however, I think there still is an approach that will get us close to our correct answer even if we don't know all these words here, even if we don't know most of these words here. 
New and interesting research conducted by Suleiman Aswedan and Moth Alhaj is inspired by their observation that though there have been many, and notice, though there have been many studies of the effect of high altitude on blood chemistry, there is a something of studies of the effect of blood chemistry li of living in locations below sea level, such as California towns of Salton City and Sealy. Okay. So though there has been many of this, there has been, so we're looking for the opposite of many. Okay. We're looking for few. There have been few studies of the effect. So we are looking for any word that is either synonymous with few or doesn't mean few. Okay. So profusion, if we know what profusion means, Profusion means many or overwhelming. Okay, think about profuse, um, meaning comes, you know, uh, there was, you know, the uh, profuse just means in large amounts. For some reason, I'm only thinking of blood, okay, which is not probably the best example to give. Um, but yeah, it means in excess, all right? So profusion is in excess. Verismilitude, huh? What is this word? Okay, that, we can get profusion, right? Veris, meaning truth. Verismilitude is a truthfulness in appearance. It comes from a Roman sculpture which stopped per, per, uh presenting an idealized version of the face, right? So their sculpture, their portrait sculpture, you would include what they said, warts and all, which is where that phrase comes from, on, say, sculptures of senators or what have you. you would, they would show wrinkles on the forehead. They would show balding. They would show the character of the person through verisimilitude, which is to look or appear very truthful. And eventually it kind of created its own idealistic portrayal in a weird way where they would do those things even for people who maybe didn't have those flaws. Finally, we have quarrel that we can get rid of. A quarrel, everybody knows, hopefully everybody knows uh, the, the famous words of Muhammad Ali, I have no quarrel with the Viet Cong when he heroically uh, went to jail so that he wouldn't fight in Vietnam. Um, quarrel means conflict right we're quarreling is to have conflict or what have you with someone so all of those none of those mean a lack of so paucity is a lack we could think of a word like pauper okay pauper is a poor person um you know princes and paupers or a paucite um so from there, paw, meaning few or little, being poor, you're a pauper, paucity means a lack of or little of. So there are there's a lit there's a lack of studies of the effect of blood chemistry or the effect on blood chemistry of living below sea level. That's what we're looking for. Okay, question eight. We here we have a uh Text structure and purpose question is what the SAT is calling it. Um, what I want us to remember is that we are not in an English class, right? We are not in your high school AP Lang, AP Lit class, where we want to interpret this in a kind of compelling, interesting way. What we want to do here is stick to the text. So the following text is from... Jewett's 1899 short story, Martha's Lady. Martha is employed by Miss Pine as a maid. Miss Pine sat by the window watching in her best dress, looking stately and calm. She seldom went out now, and it was almost time for the carriage. Martha was just coming in from the garden with the strawberries and with more flowers in her apron. It was a bright, cool evening in June. The golden robin sang in the elms, and the sun was going down behind the apple trees at the foot of the garden. The beautiful old house stood wide open to the long expected guest. Okay, so in an English class, we can read this with a lot of meaning. We can see strawberries and flowers in June and think that, oh, is this an ode to summer 
what have you, okay? The purpose of this text, we want to stick to the text, okay? So what do we have going on? We have a long expected guest. We have Miss Pine watching the window and Martha, a maid, getting everything ready. Um, so we have that going on. I also want to use deductive reasoning, okay? I want to get rid of things rather than just confirm things. So convey the worries brought on by a new guest. Are there worries anywhere? No. So we can get rid of A. There's nowhere where they say it worries. Could we infer worries? Uh, I wouldn't say so either because we have this calmness. To describe how characters have changed over time, that's definitely not the case. We don't have time really here. C, to contrast the activity outdoors with the stillness out indoors with the stillness outside. Now, that's pretty interesting, okay? Um, you know, but do we have that? Do we have activity indoors? I mean, she's just sitting. Um, and do we have activity outdoors or with, do we have stillness outdoors rather? I mean, this is a bit of activity, so we can get rid of this. D, to depict the setting as though characters await a visitor's arrival. Is that really literary and metaphorical and interesting of an answer choice? No. But is there anything wrong with the answer choice? That's what I want our brain to thinking. Is there anything wrong with this? And is there? Simply no. We get the setting, right? It's summertime. And what's going on? Characters are awaiting a long expected guest. Nothing wrong with it. Therefore, we have to go with it. Okay, so question nine, module one of test 393, we have the selection from Jane Austen's Sense and Sense ability. Um, this is a text purpose structure or a uh, central ideas or details question. Um, the SAT doesn't define those differences incredibly well, if I'm being honest. Um, but more important, we have something from Jane Austen, right? 1811. This is a classic example of where vocabulary is important for your success on the test, not only on the vocab questions, but elsewhere. So we want to know what is true about Eleanor, okay, as we read this. Uh, kind of cross that out there almost. Um, we want to know what is true about Eleanor. So we focus on Eleanor. Eleanor lives with her younger sisters and her mother, Mrs. Dashwood. Eleanor, the eldest daughter, whose advice was so effectual, possessed a strength of understanding and coolness of judgment, which qualified her, though only 19, to be the counselor of her mother and enabled her frequently to counteract to the advantage of them all, that eagerness of mind in Mrs. Dashwood, which is her mother. Okay, these are the same people. That eagerness of mind to Mrs. Dashwood, which must have generally led to imprudence. Okay, imprudence is with Mrs. Dashwood. Right? We can even maybe use a different color here. Imprudence, Mrs. Dashwood, understanding coolness of judgment, Eleanor. Effectual Eleanor. Eleanor had an excellent heart. Her disposition was affectionate and her feelings were strong. But more than anything, she knew how to govern them. It was a knowledge which her mother had yet to learn and which one of her sisters had resolved never to be taught. Okay, so yellow is not Eleanor. Pink is Eleanor. Okay, so we are focused on Eleanor. We don't want to get a opposite distractor. So remember, we are not go. We don't want to infer anything too far. We want to treat ourselves as a waiter at a restaurant. We don't want to make an inference as to whether siblings are dating when they walk into the restaurant, right? Because if you guess the wrong way, you're probably getting a little bit of too low of a tip, okay? Um, so an answer choice like C, Eleanor thinks her mother is a bad role model. Could you maybe think that someone who, you know, is imprudent is a bad, uh, a bad role model? You might think that. But does Eleanor say that anywhere in here? Does her narrator put those words in Eleanor's mouth or in Eleanor's brain? No. Um, overly sensitive. 
Is there anything that suggests that she's overly sensitive to her family matters? No. Even though she maybe is a little bit sensitive in a good way, not overly sensitive. A, Eleanor often argues with her mother but fails to change her mind. Is that something that we could, that could be plausible of this, right? If, you know, she's a counselor of her mother and they encounteract the differences between them. Perhaps you could assume that there might be some arguments and perhaps you could assume that if the mother has an imprudence, maybe she isn't always liable to have her mind changed. But that is too far from this text for the SAT. We want to stick really close to the text. So what is good here? An answer choice like D. Even this word remarkably, this qualifier is something that might seem scary to us. I would even want us to kind of see a little bit as an uncomfortable word. Um, but it's perfect, right? Because she is only 19. She's more mature than her mother. She's more mature than her sisters. One of her sisters will ever be, right? She's basically the leader of the house as a 19-year-old, despite having a mother, okay? So she is indeed remarkably mature for her age. Is that the most compelling or interesting uh, inference to make on this? No, but it is the one that has nothing wrong with it. So we have to go with it. Okay, so with question 10 of module one here on test 393, we have a central ideas question, okay, and details question. So we want to determine the main idea of this text in a way that sticks to the text, that doesn't go too far, okay? Believing that living in an impractical space can heighten awareness and even improve health, conceptual artists Madeline Ginz and Shusaka Arakawa Design an apartment building in Japan to be more fanciful than functional. That's important right there. Impractical can heighten awareness and even improve health. A kitchen counter is chest high on one side and knee high on the other. A ceiling has a door to nowhere. The, defect, the effect is disorienting but invigorating. After four years there, filmmaker Nobu Yamawaka reported significant health benefits okay so obviously notice these are different people we have our artists who made it okay who are artists our artists are madeline gins and shushaka arakawa and then we have a different person a filmmaker named nobu yamawaka yamawaka who reported significant health benefits okay so the main idea of the text is impractical space can improve health, okay? So we're looking for something that matches that. We want to go deductive. A, although inhabiting a home surrounded by fanciful features can be rejuvenating, it is unsustainable. Was this stated anywhere in the text? No, okay? Even if you might think that, oh, I wouldn't want to live somewhere like that. That sounds chaotic. Sure, that might be what you think. But is that the main idea of the text? Does the text ever, anywhere say it's unsustainable? No. Do not be arrogant with these. Do not assume that what you think has any bearing on the text, right? Go by the text. B, designing disorienting spaces like those in the Gins and Arakawa building is the most effective way to create a physically stimulating environment. All right, this is a classic distractor on the SAT. That most creates what we call a too extreme distractor. Did they in anywhere in this text say that this is more effective than any other way of creating a physically st stimulating environment? No, they just said it was physically stimulating, but there could be other things that are equally or more physically stimulating, therefore, or mentally stimulating really. So therefore we have to get rid of B just because of that word most. That most is plenty to get rid of it. Another distractor for C, as a filmmaker, Yamaoka has long supported the designs of conceptual artists such as Gins and Arakawa. Okay, for one, you don't see any other conceptual artists here or this filmmaker interacting with any other conceptual artists. Secondly, how do we know that this was long supported, right? Four years, I guess, maybe gives that away, but I don't think that that's enough there. 
Okay. Finally, is that the main idea? No. Even if C is possibly true, it doesn't really answer the question. So we're already needing to select D solely by get rid getting rid of A, B, and C for very sensible reasons. And what does D say? Though impractical, the design may improve the well-being of residents. It's exactly what we have here. Though impractical, it might heighten awareness and improve health. Perfect. Okay, so for question 11 here on module one of 393, we have a really tricky question, honestly, okay? We're being asked to find a work by a historian which would best illustrate the student's claim. So what is our goal here? It's to find the student's claim. But we don't want to go too far with what they're claiming, okay? So let's read. What does the student claim? In a research paper, a student criticizes some historians of modern African policy politics, claiming that they, okay, they are the historians. So here's the claim. Claiming that they have evaluated Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister of what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, primarily as a symbol rather than in terms of his actions. All right. So this student's an idiot. Let's just let's just take that for granted, right? The student is really, really pathetic for writing this paper. Of course, the college board would have this student write this paper because they're equally pathetic. However, let's evaluate what is the student's claim. The student's claim isn't that Patrice Lumumba isn't anything about Patrice Lumumba, ultimately. The student's claim is just that historians view Patrice Lumumba as a symbol rather than in terms of his actions. So this little edgelord's claim is that Patrice Lumumba is evaluated as a symbol rather than in terms of his actions, rather right? the context of his actions, the fact he was murdered by us, for example. Um, so we want to find a historian's quote that shows him being evaluated as a symbol rather than as a political actor, okay? So we're not looking for something that says the student's claim. We're looking for something that illustrates the student's claim, which is different, okay? So we want somewhere that shows his actions aren't enough. We need to look at him as a symbol. That's what a histor historian would say, according to the student, who, again, is feeble. So Lumumba is a difficult figure to evaluate due to starkly conflicting opinions he inspired during his life and continues to inspire today. All right, this is wrong. Um, I mean, for one, the conflicting opinions, you have idiot people who have one opinion and smart people who have another opinion. Um, but that's irrelevant here. Um, Difficult figure to evaluate due to starkly conflicting opinions. That's not why he's a difficult figure to evaluate, according to the student. B, the available information makes it clear that Lumumba's political beliefs and values were largely consistent throughout his career. This is a sensible take that goes against what our silly little student believes. Um, so we can get rid of B. C, Lumumba's practical accomplishments can be passed over quickly. It is mainly as the personification of Congolese independence that it war that he warrants scholarly attention. Okay, this is exactly what this student is saying. The student is saying that historians don't think about his pr practical or personal accomplishments as a poly you know it, his actions. They're not thinking about his actions or accomplishments. They mainly are mainly are focusing on him as a symbol or personification of Congolese independence. Finally, we have D. Many questions remain about Lumumba's ultimate vision for an independent Congo. Without new evidence coming to light, these questions are likely to remain unanswered. Or they could say on account of him being assassinated or murdered, we would never get to see what he wanted Congo to look like while independent. So we have to go with C, right? This is the thing which best illustrates this really silly claim by, you know, ultimately this idiotic student. All right, so for question 12 here, we have a command of evidence question based on a figure, quantitative command of evidence, the college board would call it. Okay, so 
I prefer to read the passage first and then look at our graph. But I do like to at least understand what the graph has here. So we have our different axes. These are different locations um, on our x-axis. On our y-axis, we have uh, the percentage of female farmers as a from the total of farmers. Um, and then the parameters on our graph, we have different types of crops, either cereals, root crops, or non-root vegetables. So, geographer Adebayo Aluwole Aludoyan and his colleagues surveyed small-scale farmers in three locations in Ondo State, Nigeria, which has mountainous terrain in the north, an urbanized center, and coastal terrain in the south. To learn more about their practices, like the types of crops they mainly cultivated. In some regions, female farmers were found to be especially prominent in the cultivation of specific types of crops, and even constituted the majority of far farmers who cultivated these cr crops. For instance, so we are looking for something which will finish this example, or which will exemplify this claim. What is the claim? That the women farmers are the majority farmers for certain crops in certain areas. So what, what is that crop? Non-root vegetables, so this black, is over 50% in North Ondo, which is the mountainous area, and South Ondo, which is the coastal area. No other parameter is over half for female farmers anywhere else. So North Ondo and South Ondo. So we're looking for something which says non-rich vegetables are cultivated primarily by women in North Ondo and South Ondo. So which effectively uses data to complete the example. Um, A, most of the farmers who mainly cultivated cereals and most of the farmers who mainly cultivated non root vegetables in South Ondo were women. Okay, so cereal cultivators in South Ondo, the majority are not women. Women do not make up the majority. So while A would be a really good finish to this if it were true, the graph shows us that it is not true. That is a classic distractor from the SAT. They will give us an answer choice which answers the question effectively but doesn't effectively use the evidence that is provided for us. B, more women in central Ondo mainly cultivated root crops than mainly cultivated cereals. That's just not true, nor does it help us with our example. Remember, we're looking for a claim, or we're looking for an example which supports the claim that female farmers grew primarily, were the primary growers of one particular type of crop in different geographical areas. B doesn't do anything for that. C, most of the farmers who mainly cultivated non-root vegetables in North and South Ondo were women. That's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for something that says, women were the primary farmer who grew non-root vegetables, right, in North Ondo and South Ondo, because both of them reach above our 50% threshold, right? So C is perfect, but let's just look at D, see if we're maybe falling for some sort of mistake in C. D, a relatively equal proportion of women across the three regions of Ondo mainly cultivated cereals. Um, well, that could plausibly be true. What does that have to do to support our claim, which is that female farmers were the majority of farmers who cultivated a certain crop in certain regions? Um, so C is our best answer for 12. Okay, and now we are on here, question 13 for module one of 393. <clears throat> In the 20th century, ethnographers made a concentrated, concerted effort to collect Mexican American folklore, but they did not always agree about the folklore's origins. Scholars such as Aurelio Espinosa claim that Mexican American folklore derived largely from the folklore of Spain. Okay, so I'm gonna separate 
there are two authors here, okay, or two claims, because you've already seen this before. So we have Espinoza claiming that it derived from Spain, which ruled the area from the 16th to early 19th centuries. So Espinoza claimed that they derived from Spain, which ruled that period. Scholars such as Antonio Paredes, by contrast, okay, so here we know, oh, Americo Paredes, by contrast, argued that while some Spanish influence is undeniable, it is mainly the product of ongoing interactions of various cultures in Mexico and the United States. Ongoing is important. Oops. I want the ongoing interactions. Okay, so we want to make sure that seeing as that our question is asking which of the following will most directly support the Paredes argument, we want to make sure that our answer choice is aligning with the pink rather than the yellow. So looking at an answer like answer choice like A, the folklore and ethnographers collected include several songs written in the form as a decima, a type of poem originating in the originating in the late 16th century Spain. That is a Espinosa argument, right? Um, <clears throat> that would support part of the Paredes argument. There's some Spanish influence, right? But this is saying that it derives largely. This doesn't show the variousness, okay? So we can get rid of A. B, much of the folklore that the ethnographers collected had similar elements from region to region. So that could definitely be true, right? But for a question like this, his argument is that there is interactions in various cultures, okay? Um, what does this have to do with that? They're unrelated. Though B is plausible, does it have anything to do with the question? Does it do anything to answer our question? No. C, most of the folklore that the ethnographers collected was previously unknown to scholars. Now that's not gonna help out either of them, okay? On the basis that we're looking for an ongoing interaction. If you don't have any basis for that, right? If you don't have any previous evidence, how could you demonstrate an ongoing interaction? So using deductive reasoning, which is what I like to do, I like for us to get rid of stuff, we're resolving to D. But now let's see if D is correct anyways. Most of the folklore that the ethnographers collected consisted of corridos, which we still have. Now they're more tumbalos. Ballads about history and social life of a clearly recent origin. Okay, so this recent origin upsets the first guy's claim, right? So this doesn't work together. It doesn't work with yellow because 16th to early 19th centuries, if we're in the 20th century looking at a clearly recent origin, how could that be coming derived from the folklore of Spain? How could these songs be from the folklore of Spain? Would it make sense? But here... That's good, right? Recent origin, ongoing interactions, D. Now, I would like a more, you know, if there was an answer choice E that I could write myself, that would say, you know, um, the folklore demonstrated a intermixing of Native American, Mexican, and American influence in the Southwest. That'd be better, right? Mexican-American folklore is not derived primarily from Spain, according to an answer choice like D, which refutes Espinosa but supports Paredes. That's what we're looking for. Mainly getting rid of answer choices is your best goal. Okay, so for question 14 here, module one of 393, we are looking for a choice that logically completes the text. So we need to understand the logic of the text, where this text is going. In the early 19th century, some Euro-American farmers in the Northeastern United States used agricultural techniques developed by the Haudenosaunee, well, sometimes known as the Iroquois people, centuries earlier. But it seems that few of these farmers had actually seen Haudenosaunee farms firsthand. Barring the possibility of several farmers of the same era, independently developing techniques that the Haudenosaunee people had already invented. These facts most strongly suggest that, okay, so we need to suggest something that 
somehow Euro-American farmers in Northeastern U.S. learned Haudenosaunee techniques without exposure to Haudenosaunee farms themselves. So they must have gathered these techniques from some other person, some other way. Um, so let's just, A is correct. We know that. Okay. What do we like about A? Now it says exactly what we're going for. They must have influenced, learned these techniques from people who already had learned these techniques, right? So we have a cultural heritage being passed down. But let's find what we dislike about these other ones, because that's the more important part for you getting correct answers on the SAT. We can get rid of B because if these were not well suited to their techniques, why would they be in use? Simply put, okay. C, they were widely used in regions outside the Northeastern United States. Are we talking whatsoever about outside the Northeastern US? No. And then D, European American farmers only began to recognize the benefits of Haudenosaunee farming techniques late in the 19th century. Well, for one, is late in the 19th century at all a part that's being considered here? No, because we have the early 19th century. Okay, so that's one reason we can get rid of D. Secondly, they're using it in the early 19th century. Finally, um, they've learned these techniques without the Haudenosaunee's input, right? So direct input. So that's why we have to go with A and get rid of all the others. Okay, so 15, we have another logical inference question. Remember, we are not inferring in the same way that we would in an English test, in an English class where we're being extreme or thought-provoking. We are staying as logical as we can. We want to be methodical, logically rigorous. So basically, we have a passage that says, some artifacts recovered from excavations in the settlement come from the 13th century. And they lend credence to claims that the settlement was founded before that time. However, there is other evidence strongly supporting a 14th century founding date for the city. If both the artifact dates and the 14th century founding date are correct, what would this imply? So what we need is an explanation that says both the artifacts are as old as they are, and yet the city was founded after those artifacts were built. Now, have the same thing to this day. I mean, if you look behind me, you'll see a lot of these things are probably from the 20th century, 1960s or something like that. And yet, here we are in 2024. Am I living in 1960? No, I just have these things which are older than I am. Um, so which choice most logically completes the text? We're looking for something that says um, the artifacts are older than the city was. So, A, artifacts from the 14th century CE are more common. Huh? What does that have to do with this at all? Nothing there that's relevant. Two, the artifacts originating elsewhere, uh, the artifacts originated elsewhere and eventually reached Kula Kata through trade or migration. Okay, that makes perfect sense, right? So, they got to Kula Kata after the city was founded, but were made before the city was founded somewhere else. In the same way that these things behind me were built somewhere else in the past and came to my house eventually. C, is this plausible? Sure. But remember, we want something that is logically irrefutable. We want something that couldn't be wrong, not something that could be right. So could this be correct? Yeah, sure. But is there anything in it that does show this, especially the different region thing? No. D, Excavations at Kulakata may have inadvertently damaged some ar artifacts dating to that time. Again, while this is plausible, is this an important element to this? Is this something that's logically irrefutable? Is this in the text? No. Okay, so we're not looking for things which are just plausible. We're looking for something that can't be wrong. Is there anything wrong with me? No. Okay, so our final question of the reading section for module one is 16. In this, we have a textual evidence-based question. 
Let's highlight what's important. Okay. They're investigating what allows thale crest plants to flower faster at high temperatures. So they replace this protein in the plant with a similar found protein found in other species that display no acceleration with increased temperature. Now, then they compared plants with the original protein and the altered plants. And once it's hot, the original protein plants accelerate faster than the ones who did not. Okay? So this suggests that the protein here ELF3 is conducive towards accelerated flowering at high temperatures. It kicks in not at 22, but at 27. So once it's hot, it kicks in. So we're looking for something that says the protein ELF3 causes our plant, Athaliana, to flower in an accelerated rate in higher temperatures. So, A, one, we don't see if this is totally unique to this plant. It is true to this plant, and it isn't true to stiff brome, but it might not be true for everything else. Okay, so I'm going to use the red here, actually. So this is the part I don't like here. And is it, it also isn't relevant to the point that, the, that this part of the passage is making. B, increases production as temperatures rise. Okay, we don't know if the production of the protein increases as temperatures rise. We just know that the protein's presence enables it to increase flowering as temperatures rise. So a little bit of cart before the horse for B. C, it is the protein that enables it to respond to high temperatures. So it doesn't mention flowering, which is a bit, you know, iffy. You might be like, hmm. But... It's pretty good so far. Let's see if D enters, uh, adds flowering to the mix. Temperatures of at least 22 degrees Celsius are required for it to flower. No, for one, 22 is the wrong temperature to be talking about. And D doesn't say anything about required to flower. It just talks about accelerated flowering. So C, though it doesn't mention flowering, is our best answer choice of the rest. So going with C. Continuing on here with module one of test 393, we are now into the writing section of the test. Um, our first question has to do with connecting two independent clauses. So what are our rules for connecting two independent clauses? We can use a semicolon, we can use a period, or we can use a comma and a fanboy's conjunction. So typically underlined scribbles and notes left in margins by a former owner lowers a book's value. That can be a period, that can be a sentence, it can stand on its own. It has a subject, has an associated verb, which we call predicate, and there is no subordinating conjunction, something along the lines of, while typically, right? Something like that. If it started, while underlined scribbles and notes left in the margins by a former owner's by former owner typically lowers a book's value, that would be a dependent clause because it starts with the subordinate conjunction while. But here we don't have that. So what do we want? We need to have a comma and a coordinating conjunction, a fanboys. So let's get rid of the ones that are wrong and explain why they're wrong. Why is C wrong? It's just a comma. What error does that create? comma splice. D is wrong. It lacks a comma. It has the fanboys. That's good, but it lacks the comma. Thus, it is a run-on. B has no nothing to connect the two independent clauses and is thus a run-on. So the only one which has both the comma and the fanboys conjunction is A. So for question 18, be aware that we have two independent clauses. What are our roles for connecting two independent clauses? We can either use a comma with a fanboy's conjunction. That needs to be for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. We can use a semicolon. Or simply put, we can use a period. A lot of times I find students are afraid of using periods to connect or to see two independent clauses next to one another. 
Um, don't be afraid, okay? So we have two independent clauses. After the United Kingdom began rolling out taxes equivalent to a few cents on single-use plastic grocery bags in 2011, plastic bag consumption decreased by up to 90%. End of a clause. Such taxes are subject to what econo economists call the rebound effect. Uh, here, now we have an elaboration. As the change becomes normalized, plastic bag use starts to creep back up. So what is wrong with A? We have just a comma with no coordinating conjunction, which is what the fancy word for fanboys. Therefore, it is a comma splice. A is a comma splice. B, we have the coordinating conjunction, right? This is good, but what are we missing? The comma. Here we're missing the fanboys. So A and B are both incorrect. B is a new run on. C, we have a period. That is the one of our three ways, only three ways we can connect two independent clauses. D, or two sentences with independent clauses. D, we now have um, nothing of the sort there. So that's just a strict, straight up run on. Thus, we must go with C. So for question 19, I want us to remember what are the roles of our punctuation marks, okay? Um, so we have our first sentence ending here. I'm going to ignore the first sentence and look at just the second. Specifically, an extra leap second is added whenever time based on the planet's rotation lags a full nine tenths of a second behind time kept by precise atomic clocks. Okay, so these added leap seconds come whenever time is lagging. First things first, notice B and C. Is there any functional difference between B and C for the SAT? No. What do semicolons do? They separate two independent clauses. What do periods do? They separate two independent clauses. Are we going to be asked to decide between the two of them functioning in a different way? No. This is one of the few tips or tricks that we do that isn't rule-based, but think about it. Logically, how can we decide between B or C if both of them are correct? If they're functioning the same way, and they're there, not much we can do. So with question with answer choices like that, you might want to see, oh, is there anything else different, right? Maybe a comma after whenever or something like that that differentiates the two. But in those cases, what does a semicolon do? Separate two independent clauses. What does a period do? Separate two independent clauses. No role there for either of them. Get rid of them both. With A, we have a comma, which would be what we would do to connect a dependent clause, if this first part was a dependent clause, to an independent clause. However, this is all one same clause. We don't change subject. We do not change our predicate. Specifically, an extra leap second is added whenever time lagging. Okay. Therefore, there is no role, there is no purpose for any of the punctuation in A, B, or C. Remember, if you're reading it and you're adding a pause, intuition would suggest, yeah, there might probably be a punctuation mark there. However, Turn that intuition into something systematic. What would that punctuation mark be producing? What would its role be? If there is no role for it, then it doesn't, it isn't necessary. There is no role for a comma, a semicolon, or a period in this example. Therefore, D. Okay, so for question 20, if you're missing this, I want to point out the importance of knowing parts of speech and parts of structure and um just kind of like general grammatical rules, even if they are not what we're being asked about. So 20 is a verb tense question, right? We're trying to determine the tense of a verb, um, particularly whether enhance, you know, to enhance, it's going to be in the present tense or one of our past tenses with a helping verb, etc. cetera, okay? Or a present tense with a helping verb. So first things first though, notice that this, a volume of English, oops, my hand was not steady enough there. Um, a volume of English translations of French poems is within a pair of commas. What is that there? That is what we call a non-essential phrase. We can take that out as we consider this, okay? So additionally, we want to look for where is tense established elsewhere? Scholars understanding Okay, scholars understanding, scholars are working today. 
This isn't scholars of the past. This isn't a previous understanding. This is a current understanding, but an understanding that started in the past. Why do we know it started in the past? Well, this book was published in 1876. All right, so Bengali author Toru Dutz, A Sheaf Gleaned in French Fields. Somewhat enhanced scholars' understanding, or continues to enhance scholars' understanding of the transnational and multilingual contexts in which Dutt lived and worked. All right. Has enhanced is what we like here because has enhanced means it started in the past, yet continues into the present. Okay. Are enhancing scholars means that it's currently enhancing solely. Have enhanced means that it has ceased to enhance. And enhance means, again, solely present tense. We want this thing which means it began in the past, but it has progressed into our present. Now, we have all sorts of terms that we might want to use, or well, you know, we have all sorts of these different verb tense terms. Um, and, you know, uh, getting those solid for ourselves is uh, something that, you know, we we would like, right? It, it It's not a problematic thing to do, but we don't need to memorize it necessarily, okay? That this is what we would call the present perfect. Ultimately, doesn't, isn't going to determine whether uh, we get this right or not. We need to just think about it kind of in the logical sense, okay? Um, so, going with A. Okay, so for 21, we have a punctuation question um, asking about how do we utilize this transition word, however, in the context of this. So, though very often we see a word like how, however, a transitional adverb coming either before or coming either after or before a semicolon, that is not a rule of transitional adverbs. They do not always show up after a semicolon like some of my students have argued to me very poorly. Um, it depends on where they come in the context of the meaning, okay? Where they come in the context of the clause. So, journalists have dubbed Gil Scott Heron the godfather of rap, a title that has appeared in hundreds of articles about him since the 1990s. Scott Heron himself resisted the godfather nickname, however, feeling that it didn't encapsulate his devotion to the broader Ameri African-American blues music tradition, as well as bluesologist, the moniker he preferred. Okay. So, B would require everything after however is its own independent clause. Let's see if it is. Feeling that it didn't encapsulate his devote. Starting with feeling is already giving away that this is not an independent clause after however. Therefore, we cannot put our semicolon, which functions as a period, right there. Same goes for D. That would mean that everything after nickname is uh, an independent clause, but it's not. This whole thing, actually, I'll do it in blue. This whole sentence here is its own independent clause. It's one independent clause. Therefore, or well, yeah. Um, therefore, Actually, maybe a complex sentence. We're going to just embed, however, right? An embedded adver uh, transitional adverb is when we don't have to separate it with a period, basically. Um, a is not what we would be working with. So therefore, we go with C. Okay, so for question 22, we want to think about what our roles are here for uh, different punctuations. So first, let's see why C and D are things that we can get rid of. Both of these suggest that what comes after the piece of punctuation, be it a semicolon or a period, is an independent clause. Why? Those are only two roles for either of these punctuation marks. So, the stitching barely visible among the thousands of pieces of printed microcut fabric cannot stand on its own because it is basically just describing what comes before about the subject. Okay, the subject are, is the portrait, okay, the portrait and the quilt. That's the, the, that these are together, kind of a combined subject, the one and the same. So 
The stitching is not the subject. And yet C and D both suggest that the stitching is the subject. So we can get rid of C and D. A, we have a comma and a fanboys. Now, comma and fanboys isn't the only way we'll see a comma and and. Sometimes we'll see a comma with and if we're giving a list, right? Um, that's the classic Oxford comma, which is what we use on the SAT for very sensible reasons, right? It clarifies what each item in the list is. However, the comma and the and here is functioning in the exact same way as C and D. It's suggesting that the stitching and on forward is a independent clause. So by deductive reasoning, that leaves us only with B. So why is B correct? Well, we're just continuing, not an elaboration, but a clarification of what comes before. Um, just a general explanation. So we're just connecting it with a comma, which is what we can do here. But the main reason we want to arrive to B is why A, C, and D are incorrect. If we can get rid of things as incorrect and have a specific reason as for why it's incorrect, we can always arrive to the correct answer through the deductive approach. Okay, so for 23, we have a transitions question. With transitions questions, I want us thinking about what role do we need here? What are we transitioning between, right? And what kind of information or role do we want? So most conifers are evergreen. That is, most conifers are evergreen. That is, they keep their green leaves or needles year round. However, not all conifer species are evergreen. Large trees lose their needles every fall. So this sentence exemplifies the claim in the previous sentence. This exemplifies that not all conifer species are evergreen, right? As proven by that. So we are looking for something which says, for example, or as seen by large trees, exemplify this, okay? For instance means for example, it comes within that category. Um, nevertheless is like however. Meanwhile means it's going on at the same time. We don't have any time temporal thing here. And an addition would be to add on, right? But we're not adding on here, we're exemplifying. So therefore we are going with A. Study where the categories of transitional adverbs belong and you will become better with transitions if you're missing, missing a question like 23. Okay, so for question 24 here on module one of test 393, we are looking at uh, what we call a rhetorical synthesis question. These questions are difficult not because of the content, not because of anything other than the fact that the test suggests there's a lot more at play here than there actually is. For the, the only question on the test where I like looking at the question first are these types of questions. So the student wants to describe the rocking chair so we need to describe the rocking chair to an audience unfamiliar with Sam Maloof. Okay, so we are going to need an answer choice which has parameter A being describing the rocking chair. So we need parameter A and we need parameter B, which is describing who Sam Maloof is. Any answer choice that doesn't have both A and B will be insufficient. So Sam Maloof, we have woodworker and furniture designer. Um, that's probably the parameter B, who Sam Maloof is. He's also the child of Lebanese immigrants. That's a maybe. I'm going to kind of put a you know, little question mark there for maybe. I might need that. He received a genius grant. Probably don't need that. Um, they own a rocking chair that Maloof made. Walnut wood. Okay, that might be important, but more important, um, we need this one, okay? So we need definitely the parameter of what it looks like, right? Describing what it looks like and who Sam Maloof is. If we don't have both of those, we're not going to be good. So A, we have what it looks like. Good. And we have that it's walnut, what it's made of. Good. Let's make sure it has a little bit about Sam Maloof. We also have a little bit about Sam Maloof. All right. What's wrong with B? Well, while we have Sam Maloof, that's good. And a little bit about his life. 
What is missing? The chair. We just have the fact that the chair exists. The chair is not described. C. We have Sam Maloof, but where is the chair? Undescribed. D. We have the chair. Awesome. But what is missing? Sam Maloof. Therefore, we can get rid of D. Very often, that's how it goes. We get some parameters on their own, but only one answer choice, which combines both the parameters that we need. We always need both. Just one is not sufficient. Unless there is only one parameter. Then go with just the one parameter. Okay, with these rhetorical synthesis questions that the SAT, as the SAT calls them, these notes questions, these are the one question that I like to look at our question first before we actually read the passage. I don't advocate this for other reading questions or writing questions, but this is important. It's one place where. Why? Because we're going to be looking for very specific parameters. So the students wants to emphasize the decline in unique apple varieties in the US and specify why this decline occurred. Okay, so we need both of these parameters. So we're going to find these both parameters in here. And any answer choice that doesn't include both parameter is going to be wrong. So first, we have 14,000 unique. And now only 15 dominate the market. OK, so we went from 14,000 to 15. All right, so that's the decline in varieties. Now let's see why this occurred. The rise of industrial agriculture narrowed the range because they were not considered suitable for commercial growth. Okay, so we need something that shows that we lost a lot, so 14,000 to 15, and that this is because industrial agriculture saw it as, uh, you know, capitalist agriculture saw it as not good to have different apple types. So, an answer choice like A. The Lost Apple Project is in here, right? But is that what our, our student wants to emphasize and specify? No. Okay. Um, not enough. Not both parameters. B. Ooh, we have 14,000 going to 15. But what are we missing? No mention of industrial agriculture. So we just only have one parameter. A has zero. C. All right, look at this. We have the cause, rise of industrial agriculture. And we have emphasizing the decline. The same few resulting in the loss of thousands of varieties because of capital. So... Everything about C is good because we have both of our parameters. Now, D is a weird one, okay? Because we have, this is good, right? But what is not emphasized? Exactly how much of a decline there was. So while D has the pink, or B has the pink, D has the yellow, only C has the yellow and the pink together. Okay, so here we are with question 26 on module one of test 393, another of these rhetorical synthesis questions, the ones with the notes. As I'm gonna emphasize over and over again, we wanna find the parameters that we actually need in the question. So the first place I look for these questions, unlike every other reading question, is at the question rather than the passage. Normally I wanna read the passage first, but here I want us to focus on the question first. All right, so we want to emphasize the duration and the purpose, all right? So we are going to need both of these parameters. We're gonna need the duration of their work and the purpose of their work. So let's find these in the notes. So. Uh, the Gula are a group of African Americans who have lived in parts of the southeastern United States since the 18th century. Mm. 
All right. That's actually not a parameter because we are looking for parameters not about the longevity of the gula, but of their work. So there, not anything. Gula culture is influenced by West African and Central African traditions. Louise Miller is a gula historian, storyteller, and preservationist. Okay, so that is important. She founded the museum in 2003. And then Rodriguez is a historian, artist, and preservationist. And she founded a different museum in Georgia, or in South Carolina, in 2003. So we need since 2003, and we're going to need to include the historian, storyteller, preservationist, and artist perspective. So let's go through these. Answer choice day. We have the purpose, right? You can learn more about them and the place. But what is missing? No pink, okay? Because we only have one thing for A. B. Ah, a lot of us probably maybe chose B. We do have what their purpose is and their names. But what is missing in B? We have the wrong duration. Okay, so we have the duration of the Gula people, but we do not have the duration of their work. We need 2003, not the 18th century, so just one. Would C. We have since 2003. Okay, we finally have a pink. And we have, they've worked to preserve the culture. So that has every piece that we need. It has two. Therefore, we're going to go with C. Let's just get rid of D, though. D just describes Gula. That doesn't have any of the parameters that the student wants to emphasize. Okay, remember, we're not answering based off of what do we think is important from the notes. We are going based off of what the student wants to emphasize. Okay, so for question 27 here on module one of test 393, we have a rhetorical synthesis question, these notes questions as they are called by the SAT. Um, I always want to look at the question first, unlike other reading questions or writing questions where I want to look at the passage first, establish meaning. Here, the most important meaning is what we're focusing on, because we're, be giving, we're going to be given a lot of information that is interesting, cool, but what is actually relevant to the question will be very, very limited. So let's find what is the limited parameter that we need to find in the notes. Usually we have more than one, but in this case, we only have one. We only want to emphasize the aim of the research study. Anything more than that is superfluous, which is an SAT word, I guess, maybe for some of you, meaning more than we need, okay? Anything more than the emphasis of the aim Anything more than the aim of the research study is something that we don't need. So let's find the aim of the research study. So North America, what does it expanded into areas that were once grasslands? Okay. These people wanted to investigate whether woodland expansion is related to changes in climate. Okay. There it is. Our answer choice needs to say something along the lines of they wanted to see if it was related to changes in climate. Next, this is their methodology. They checked. Seems like their hypothesis was correct, associated with dry intervals, and drought may have played a role in woodland expansion. All right. Now, we only want this pink parameter, though. So, these are exactly the same, okay? These are exactly the same. Why, then, do I think students are missing A? or not selecting A, because this is does not seem like the most important summary of these notes. But that's not what we're being asked to do. We're not being asked to summarize these notes. We want to emphasize just the aim. So A does that. What do we have going forward? B gives a conclusion. We didn't want the conclusion. We only wanted the aim. C gives a conclusion. We didn't want the conclusion. We only wanted the aim. And D gives us the methodology, but we didn't want the methodology, we only wanted the aim. 
This kind of question isn't testing how well can you interpret data or what have you. It's really asking you how well can you follow instructions, okay? And with that, we finish up module one for test 393. Okay, so here we are on module two of test 393, starting off like every test with the vocab section. So I already have this highlighted here. Our goal is to, my goal for you is to find a word that you feel like would fit in this underlined empty box. And the way we're going to go to find that is by looking for either synonyms or antonyms or something else in the context. So according to botanists, a viburnum plant experiencing insect damage may develop erineum, discolored felty growth on its leaf blades. A blank viburnum plant, on the other hand, okay, that's our important thing right there. You missed this. You maybe didn't catch that, okay? will have leaves with smooth surfaces and uniformly green coloration. So we are looking for the opposite of, uh, of because of the, on the other hand here, that means we are looking for the opposite of a damaged viburnum plant. So what's the opposite of damaged? Probably like undamaged, okay? Um, so struggling is gonna be kind of our opposite or mirror distractor. It's the plant that we're being described beforehand as one of these struggling or damaged plants. But we're looking for the opposite of that. A beneficial plant has to, beneficial is relating to other things, right? It would be beneficial to other things. And then simple doesn't fit in this context either. So we are just going to look for healthy. Again, if you missed this, I'm likely thinking you got tripped up with struggling because you see, ah, this first sentence is talking about a struggling thing. But remember, you really need to bury yourself deep into that full context, see the whole question, and use that to get to the correct answer. Okay, question two of our second module, another vocab question. Again, we want to find our own word to fit for this underlined portion. So we're looking for either a definition, or a synonym or an antonym somewhere in the text that we can use to come up with our own word and then see whether the words given to us align with that word. I don't want us just plugging in our answer choices because if we do that, it's liable to cause a mistake. Novelist N.K. Jemison declines to something with the conventions of science fiction genre in which she writes. And she suggested that her readers appreciate her work precisely because of this willingness to thwart expectations and avoid formulaic plots and themes. Okay, so her work is what we would call iconoclastic, all right? It is thwarting expectations, avoiding formula, etc. As such, it is going against the conventions, right? So declining to adhere to the conventions is what we're looking for, something along those lines. So declining to question, if you selected this answer, you might be ignoring this, the declines too, but that's a really important piece of context there. While she might question the conventions of the science fiction genre, she doesn't decline to question them. React to is a little bit weird, doesn't really work here. Perceive would be she's ignoring that they exist whatsoever. So even if you do not know what conform to means, though we probably should, conformity meaning, or conforming to things, meaning adhering or molding to them, going with the general convention, we should still be able to get D because A, B, and C are words that we should all know. If we're missing this question, I'm assuming that we're missing it by selecting question or answer choice A. Why? Probably because we're ignoring the declines. So... Uh, though these vocab questions can be quick, you have plenty of time. Slow down. Don't let yourself miss an easy question only because it's a little tricky like this one here. Okay, question three here of module two. We have another vocab question. Um, first off, Kumiai poet, San Diego, repin. Um, okay, we're going to be looking for some word 
that would fit this underlined portion by finding a definition, a synonym or an antonym somewhere in the passage, okay? I don't want us just plugging and playing our answer choices into this underlined portion. Why? That leaves us liable to fall for a trap or a mistake. So in Nature Poem, Kumiai poet Tommy Pico portrays his blank with the natural or to the natural or what have you world by honoring, by honoring the centrality centrality of nature within his tribe's traditional beliefs while simultaneously expressing his distaste for being in wilderness settings himself okay so first off kind of a fun inversion of the typical stereotype of indigenous americans where yes we have the natural world that is central to his tribe's traditional views but also there is a distaste for being in wilderness settings himself so I, we're looking for some sort of complicated feelings, right? Some sort of nuance. He portrays his nuanced relationship with the natural world. It's something that we're looking for. So his responsiveness to the natural world would mean that he's particularly sensitive, particularly responsive to it. Um, and this part here is what's going to disprove A. It's also what's going to disprove D, mastery over. He is uncomfortable with it. Um, renunciation of the natural world. Now, his distaste might align with the renunciation, but he still seems to be wanting to understand the natural world, the, to honor the natural world as it relates to his tribe's traditional beliefs. So renunciation we can get rid of as well. Remember, to ren uh, renunciation is to renounce, right? To give up or to uh, discount Right, so renunciation of the natural world would just say it doesn't matter, but he still thinks it matters, but just maybe not so personally to him. Therefore, we have ambivalence. If we're not selecting B, it's likely because we're worried about a word that we might not know. Ambivalence is a word which has the root ambi or prefix, maybe I don't know. Uh, ambi we hear in other words like ambidextrous, right? Um, it comes up in words like ambient, okay? Ambidextrous, ambient, meaning kind of like both or surrounding or what have you. Um, so when someone's ambidextrous, they use their left hand and the right hand. So ambivalence is a dualness of feeling. If you're feeling ambivalent towards something, you maybe both have positive feelings like Tommy Pico does here and negative feelings like he does here. So even if you don't know what ambivalence means, though, I think we can arrive to this answer choice by getting rid of these three other ones, which are words that we really should know. If you're struggling with a word like renunciation or ambivalence, remember our approach of you can figure the meaning of words by kind of squinting and using roots to arrive to a meaning. Okay, so uh, this is not question 54. It is question four. I don't know why that happened. Um, however, question four here on module two, we have a text structure and purpose question about a poem. So the following is from the 1924 poem Cycle by Darcy McNichol, who is a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. There shall be new roads wending. A okay, wending means traveling or tra traveled. It's an archaic word. And usually I think people went. Right, we were wending. Um, so, yeah, yeah, a new beating of the drum. Men's eyes shall have fresh seeing. Gray lives surprise their span. But under the new sun's be being, completing what night began. There'll be the same back spending, the same sad feet shall drum. When this night finds its ending, a day shall have come. Okay. So, um, we have day, night running into day, or day running into night, into day, into night, into day. Um, and yet new things happen all the while, okay? So, the main purpose of this text I want us to be deductive, okay? I want us getting rid of things that do not work. So, we know the answer is A. 
Let's find what's wrong with B, C, and D. To question whether activities completed at one time of day are more memorable than those completed at another time of day. Memory is not a consideration in this passage. Simply put, if memory doesn't come up in the passage, we cannot do that. Now, you could maybe make a compelling argument for this in an AP English class where you go really, really deep and esoteric to use an SAT word. However, on the SAT, remember, we are sticking very close to the text. We're making conservative, cautious inferences. Okay, They're not talking about memory. Can't include it. To refute an idea that joy is more commonly experienced emotion than sadness is. All right. Do we get joy versus sadness? I don't think so. Now, we have the sad come up here with sad feet, but do we hear this idea of joy or put them together? Or do we have anywhere that's saying, ah, <clears throat> everyone says joy is more common than sadness, but I reject that notion. No. Okay. Finally, to demonstrate how the experiences of individuals relate to the experiences of their communities. Okay. We do have some invocation of community here, I suppose, on the basis of, you know, backspending, plural, feet, not foot. Um, however, are we relating these to one another? Are we putting community into the context of the individual? No. So A is one that has nothing wrong with it. We have repetitiveness. And then we have some level of joy or rewardingness, but also some level of challenge, okay? Therefore, we go with A. Okay, here on question five in module two, we have another purpose and structure question about a text this time from Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. Um, it's from 1814, okay? So this is one of those classic instances where vocabulary uh, isn't being asked directly in the question, and yet having a good understanding of vocabulary will be to our benefit on this question. All right, so the speaker, Tom, is considering staging a play at home with a group of his friends and family. We mean nothing but a little amusement among ourselves, just to vary the scene and exercise our powers in something new. Okay, so when he says we, we mean, he's not saying we mean nothing in the same way that doesn't mean anything, right? It means that's all they're intending. I meant you no harm, right, is a phrase. That's, that's how mean is being used here. We don't want anything but a little amusement among ourselves, just to vary the scene, change things up, and exercise our powers in something new. We want no audience, no publicity. We may be trusted, I think, in choosing some play most perfectly unexceptionable. And I conceive no greater harm or danger to any of us in conversing in the elegant written language of some respectable author than in chattering in words of our own. Okay, so not only does it seem like he's considering it, it seems like he's convincing, okay? He is trying to convince someone that he's going to have a play that will be they're, they're unobjectable, okay? Nothing will be a problem in it. Nobody will be coming. The play won't be too exciting. There'll be no harm. There will be, you know... <laughs> It'll be a simple, fine thing. The purpose of this is to convince someone we should do a play because don't worry, it's going to be chill, right? So we're going to look for an answer choice that aligns with that and get rid of answer choices that don't. So A, to offer Tom's assurance that the play will be inoffensive. That's what we mean by unexceptional. We don't mean bad when we're reading unexceptional. We mean no harm or danger. It will involve only a small number of people, as we see there, okay? That's everything we want. A has everything we want with nothing wrong. Let's see if there's anything wrong in B, C, or D. That's how we want to get rid of them. B, to clarify the play will not be performed in the manner had that Tom originally intended. We can't read into that from this. 
There's nothing among this passage that suggests that that will absolutely be true. It could be true, but we need to choose answer choices which are irrefutable. So even though if there's a plausibility that B may perhaps go on, we cannot choose it. Um, does Tom lack the skills to successfully stage a play? We have no idea. It's not discussed in this passage. To assert that Tom believes the group performing the play will be able to successfully promote it, they don't want an audience. They don't want publicity, so they're not promoting it. So we have reasons to get rid of B, C, and D, and we have a reason for A. So for question six, we have another text structure and purpose question, okay? So here we're focused on the structure. What is the structure? What does it do? So let's look at this, okay? Musician Joni Mitchell, who is also a painter, uses the images she creates for her album covers to emphasize ideas expressed in her music. Okay, here we have some sort of claim, all right? So we have a claim starting off. For the cover of her album, Turbulent Indigo, Mitchell painted a striking self-portrait that closely resembles Vincent van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear. Okay, so this seems to exemplify, provide an example of her of the author's initial claim, which is that the album covers inform or emphasize the ideas of the music. The image calls attention to the album's title song, in which Mitchell sings about the legacy of the post-impressionist painter. Van Gogh. In that song, Mitchell also hints that she feels a strong artistic connection to Van Gogh, an idea that is reinforced by her imagery on the cover. Okay, so this is redundant for your sake. Right, this is really clarifying. Everything later is an example of, it serves the first point. So the first point is the most important point, okay? We wanna make sure that that is clear for us. So A, it presents a claim about Mitchell, then gives an example supporting that claim. That's exactly what we see here. All right, so I like A. I'm not gonna select it yet. I'm gonna see if we can get rid of others first. B, it discusses Van Gogh's influence on Mitchell, then considers Mitchell's influence on other artists. Okay. Do we get this part? No. Okay. Is that the structure? No. It describes a similarity between two artists, then notes a difference between them. Do we see a difference between them? It doesn't note it. Are we discussing the similarity between two artists? No. Finally, isn't this about Joni Mitchell's covers? Does he talk about that whatever, whatsoever? No. Finally, D, it describes the songs on Turbulent Indigo, then explains how they, they relate to this album's cover. That might be true of this portion, although songs, I think, is uh, maybe it's a song. However, that doesn't relate to this most important topic sentence. So A is the only one which says, we have a claim, and that claim is supported through a specific example. Therefore, we go with that. Okay, so with question seven here in module two, we have a cross text connection question, meaning we have two texts, one and two, and we need to see how they relate to one another. So our question asks, how would the Patrika and Shu, the text two arguers, most likely characterize the conclusion presented in text one? So this is important. When we're inferring how they might respond to a conclusion presented in text one, we know that they basically already do, okay? They're not going to have us think, ah, oh, well, you know, Purika and Shu seem like nice people, so they'll gently, you know, refute, or they're really nice, so they might just agree. We're not being asked to infer anything about them as people or what their arguments might be. We're just going to be reading the texts seeing what their arguments are and making a logical comparison between the two. So text one, astronomer Mark Holland and colleagues examined four white dwarfs, small dense remnants of past stars, in order to determine the composition of exoplanets that used to orbit those stars. Studying wavelengths of light in the white dwarf atmospheres, the team reported that traces of elements such as lithium and sodium supported the presence of exoplanets with continental crusts similar to Earth. Okay, so what does text one say? Looking at white dwarfs, we see that those exoplanets that used to, you know, uh, revolve around those white dwarfs back when they were normal suns had crusts similar to Earth. Text two, 
Past studies of white dwarf atmospheres have concluded that certain exoplanets had continental crusts. Okay, this is... That is text one. The past studies are text one. Geologist P Keith Puderica and astronomer C. E. Shu argue that those studies unduly emphasize atmospheric traces of lithium and other individual elements as signifiers of the types of rock found on Earth. Okay, they are refuting the text one claim. They do it in the text. We don't have to infer it. The studies don't adequately account for different minerals made up of various ratios of those elements and the possibility of rock types not found on Earth that contain those minerals, okay? So they question it because they are saying, we're not considering that maybe there are different rock types or maybe the ratios are different, etc. So let's see this. A, as unexpected, because it was widely believed at the time that white dwarf planets lack continental crusts. Okay, um, that is not how Pudrika and Zhu focus. We're looking for them to say they refute the claim because they're not considering all the necessary factors. Widely believed has nothing to do with it. B, premature, okay, hmm, that sounds good. Because researchers have only just begun trying to determine what kinds of crusts they had. Ah, now this is the part that's wrong. So premature is good. But the rest of that answer choice is flawed. C, as questionable. Okay, that's good. Because it rests on an incomplete consideration of potential sources of the elements. All right. So... It is questionable because it doesn't consider all the factors. That's a good answer choice so far. Let's see if D is somehow better. Puzzling. Okay, I like puzzling. Because it's un you unusual to successfully detect lithium and sodium. Okay, this part is wrong. So we need every parameter to be correct. C is the only one which puts everything into dialogue. Therefore, C is our correct answer. Okay, so for question eight, we have a details question, all right? We are we have this phrase, according to the text. Whenever we see that, we know we need to pull something directly from the text. Utah is home to Pondo, a colony of about 47,000 quaking aspen trees that all share a single root system. Pondo is one of the largest single organisms by mass on Earth. But ecologists are worried that its growth is declining in part because of grazing by animals. The ecologists say that strong fences, or perhaps wolves, me here, uh, could prevent deer from eating young trees and help Pondo start thriving again. So why are they worried? Well, because we see that uh, its growth is declining. They are worried that its growth is declining. And why? Because of grazing, right? Um, so we need it to say growth is declining or that grazing is too significant, something like that. That's why they're worried. So A, a it isn't growing at the same rate it used to. Growth is declining and growing at the, isn't growing at the same rate it is used to are the same thing. Its growth rate has changed in the negative sense. Um, B, it isn't producing young trees anymore. Well, it seems like the young trees are being produced, but they're being eaten, all right? So we can get rid of B. C, it can't grow into new areas because it is blocked by fences. No, they want fences. So we can get rid of C. And D, its root system can't support any many more new trees. They talk about the root system, but it isn't that it can't support new trees. It just seems that it's being overgrazed and therefore, its growth rate is declining. Therefore, A is our only answer choice that we can pull from the text. All right, so question nine here on module two, we have another detailed question, right? Just like question eight, anytime we see according to the text, we know that we're going to be pulling something directly from the passage. Um, this, to me, is a good example of how even though this isn't a grammar question, even though this isn't a writing question, this is on the reading portion of the test, grammar is significant. Why? 
we have this large, large non-essential phrase here, which we need to know, we, we, we need to follow, but it stands in the way of what we're really looking to understand, which is that for many years, the only existing fossil evidence of this thing came from four species on the paleo continent. So old continent, we're going to use our root word there of La Russia. Okay. So we've identified only four species living on La Russia is their only evidence of what these, you know, aquatic arthropods. Um, now, in a discovery that expands our understanding of the geographical distribution of mixopetrids, okay, the things that we're talking about, so it's our geographical distribution, expands our understanding of the geographical distribution. Paleontologists Bo Wang and others have identified fossilized remains of a new species of this family that lived over 400 million years ago on the paleo continent of Gondwana. All right, so look at that. What we have, what's important, is it expands our understanding of the geographical distribution. So let's get rid of the wrong answers and find what's right about our right answer. A, it constitutes the first evidence that they lived more than 400 million years ago. Okay, that's not right because initial evidence is only about where they were. We're focused on just the geographical distribution, not how old they are. So even though 400 million years ago is brought up at the end here, the comparison only has to do with geography. B, it establishes that they are more closely related than previously thought to modern arachnids and horseshoe crabs. There's no mention of that. That they were related doesn't mean that they are more closely related than we thought. C, the fossil helps establish a more accurate timeline. Okay, again, timeline is not what we're focused on here. So, D, it talks about geography, okay? That's the one thing we're looking for here. That's what's actually being compared. So why is it significant? Well, because it expands our understanding of the geographical distribution. Therefore, D. All right, so question 10 here in module two asks, honestly, the weirdest question type that we have on the new SAT. These ones which want us to illustrate the claim uh, using a piece of poetry. Um, I'm not going to give too much of my opinion on how I feel about these question types. Let's just do our best with it. The poet Walt Whitman is an 1887 essay by Jose Marti, a Cuban author and political activist originally written in Spanish. In the essay, Marti explores the value of literature, thus talking about Walt Whitman, arguing that a society's spiritual well-being depends on the character of its literary culture. So we are going to look for something that shows society's spiritual well-being related to the character of its literary culture. We want to say a strong literary culture in character, the strong character of literary culture means a strong sp spiritual society or the opposite, what have you. So let's look through these. Poetry, which is literary culture, which brings together or separates, which fortifies or brings anguish, which stores up or demolishes souls, which gives or robs men of faith and vigor, is more necessary to a people than industry itself. For industry provides them with a means of subsistence, while literature gives them the desire and strength for life. Right, so this is that the goal of life is not subsistence, but understanding what that subsistence can provide, the desire and strength for life, okay? So poetry is more important than industry to a people, okay? A people here means society because literature gives them the desire and strength for life. So far, I'm liking this idea of A. Let's look at B. Every society brings to literature its own form of expression. And the history of the nations can be told with the greater truth by the stages of literature than by chronicles and decades. Okay, this is really a hard answer choice to get rid of. Because we have society, we have literature, but this isn't saying that the well-being 
the spiritual well-being of society in the present tense is determined by literature, but rather that literature is a better gauge of history. Okay, so this is the wrong topic. This is talking about history, this section. This is not talking about the spiritual well-being of society. So this is a really hard distractor to get rid of, but it is nonetheless incorrect. Um, with C, where will a race of men go when they have lost the habit of thinking with faith about the scope and meaning of their actions? The best among them, those who consecrate nature with their sacred desire for the future, will lose in a sordid and painful annihilation all stimulus to alleviate the ugliness of humanity. So this is phenomenal writing, okay? And perhaps this could do plausibly with the loss of literature. Maybe literature is something that instills the habit of thinking with faith about the scope and meaning of their actions, which he kind of suggests in A. But does C explicitly refer to literature or to poetry or what, what have you, however we want to constitute literature? There's no explicit reference whatsoever. Okay, we are on the SAT. We need things put out for us as directly and clearly as possible. C isn't doing that for us, so we have to get rid of it. Finally, D, listen to the song of this hardworking and satisfied nation. Listen to Walt Whitman. The exercise of himself exalts him to majesty. Tolerance exalts him to justice and order to joy. Okay, this doesn't connect the importance of society well-being, societal well-being and the character of its literary culture. It re references Walt Whitman, right, which is a recycled language distractor. Um, but A does it more clear than D does. D, we can plausibly infer that this is suggesting what the claim is. This plausibly supports the claim that a society's spiritual well-being depends on its literary culture. But A directly says it. So we're always going to go with A over D. We're always going to go with it directly being said, explicitly being said, rather than it being said on a subtextual or inference level where it's only plausible or likely. A is irrefutable, D is likely. Irrefutable is better. Therefore, we go with A. Okay, so for question 11 here in module two, we have a command of evidence quantitative question, meaning something of the quantitative information here will interact with the textual information here to answer the actual question. So we've already looked at this, we've answered this question. What is in our figure? What is in our quantitative information? We have different estimation methods approximating the bite force of tyrannosaurids, okay? And as we can see, these bite forces are very different. The estimations for these bite forces are very different depending on the estimation method used. So we see that these two estimation methods are different. And they have very different results. These two estimation methods are similar or the same, and they result in very similar approximations of the bite force. And any of the ones that are different as they, there are three different estimation methods produce very varying bite force approximations. So. What does the text say? Largest tyrannosaurids are thought to have the highest, the strongest bites of any land animals in Earth's history. Now, this is the important part. This is what I'm focusing on. Determining the bite force of extinct animals can be difficult, however. Paleontologists Paul Barrett and Emily Rayfield have suggested that an estimate of dinosaur bite force may be significantly influenced by the methodology used in generating this estimate. Okay, so... We are looking for the Barrett and Rayfield suggestion. That is our goal, is to find what supports their suggestion. And what is their suggestion? That methodology, this is the method, influences the estimate. Influences the estimate. Okay. So which answer choices say that method influences estimate based off of the quantitative information? So A, the study by Mears. Okay, this is Mears. A used body mass scaling and produced the lowest exist estimated maximum bite force, while the study that used muscular and skeletal modeling produced the highest estimated maxim maximum. Okay. Um, so first things first. A, if true, would be really good support. 
But this is a classic distractor for these command of evidence quantitative questions. What is classic about this distractor? Well, Mears did not have the lowest estimated maximum bite force. It had the highest estimated maximum bite force. And cost used the muscular and skeletal modeling, sure, but they didn't get the highest maximum. Mears did. So it's just not factual, okay? Just because it makes sense logically doesn't mean it actually provides the information to answer the question. B, in their study, Zizhnak and Erickson use tooth-bone interaction to analysis to produce an estimated bite range of this. Okay, is that true? That's definitely true in here. We do see that that's what they produce, but we need some sort of comparison to say that the methodology generates the estimate and that is a big influence on what kind of estimate you get. So we don't have a comparison to any of the other methods. Because we don't, we can't choose B. C, the bite force estimates produced by Bates and Falkingham and by Cost et al. were similar to each other. Why were they similar to each other? Because they had the same estimation method. While estimation, estimates produced by Mears and by Zizhnak and Erickson each differed substantially from any other estimate. Why? Because they had different methods. So I like this answer choice, but I might like it better if they said explicitly because of methodology or perhaps showing because of methodology. So let's see if D does that. And if D doesn't, we'll go with C. But if D does, we might go with D. The estimated maximum bite force, for, bite force produced by cost et al. exceeded the maximum ma produced by Bates and Falkingham, even though both groups of researchers used the same method to generate their estimates. Okay, that's an opposite distractor. That's saying that the methodology doesn't actually result in differences in bite for us estimation. It's something else. So therefore, the only answer choice which says methodology differing produces different approximations is C. Okay, so for question 12, we have another command of evidence, quantitative information question, meaning that the quantitative information stored in this table will interact with this text to relate to our question. Okay, so first things first thing is that we've done this. Let's see what we're being asked. Which choice best describes data from the table that supports the researcher's hypothesis? So we really are going to need to know what the researcher's hypothesis is. We also want to know basically what the table is doing. So we see, let's just read it first. Um, when hibernating, marmots and arctic ground squirrels enter a state called torpor, which minimizes energy needed to function. Often a hibernating animal will temporarily come out of torpor, called an arousal episode, and its metabolic rate will rise, burning more of the precious energy the animals need to survive the winter. Alaska marmots hibernate in groups and therefore burn less energy keeping warm during these episodes than they would if they were alone. A researcher hypo hypothesized, okay, here's the hypothesis, this is important, that because ground squirrels hibernate alone, they would likely exhibit longer bouts of torpor and shorter arousal periods than Alaska mar marmots. Okay, so why is this hypothesis coming together? Well, because um, they can't do it, right? Because marmots, when they arouse, you know, have an arousal episode, they don't lose as much energy. Ground squirrels doing it alone can't do it as often. So we want something that says ground squirrels have longer bouts of torpor and shorter arousal periods. So they're sleepy more, awake less. So here's our ground squirrels. We want to find longer bouts. Okay, so it's not how many. We don't need this. That's irrelevant to us. We want the duration. So duration is exceeded. Good. And that the arousal periods are shorter. Okay, so we don't, episodes of arousal is irrelevant to us. We are focusing just on period. So duration and period, these two, we want this one longer, good. And this one shorter, good. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be focused on. A. Alaskan marmots' arousal periods lasted for days, while their arousal episodes lasted less than a day. 
Okay, that's not true. Okay, if that were true, it would be good. But their arousal periods lasted for 12 hours or 21 hours. Okay, days doesn't work. Looking at B, the Alaska marmots and Arctic ground squirrels both maintain torpor for several consecutive days per bout on average. That's not good because we're looking for a difference between these two categories, right? We want to suggest that the duration of torpor for the ground squirrels was longer than it was for our marmots. So we can get rid of this answer choice on that basis. C, the Alaska marmots had shorter torpor bouts and longer arousal periods. Okay, perfect. So this is exactly the opposite of this, but it's talking about the other thing, right? So it's actually exactly the same. So if ground squirrels have longer bouts of torpor, that means marmots have shorter bouts of torpor. Good. And if Arctic ground squirrels would have shorter arousal periods, that would mean that marmots would have longer arousal periods, which we also have here. And we also just need to make sure that it's borne out in the data, which as we can tell, looking at the data, it is borne out. So everything seems fine with C. Let's just look at D and see if anything's wrong there. Marmots had more torpor bouts than arousal periods. Okay. We're not caring about the quantity of bouts and of, of either torpor or arousal. We're caring about the duration. That's the only thing that this researcher is hypothesizing. Therefore, C is perfectly valid. All right, so question 13 of module two here is a command of evidence question again, although we also have an idea of inference or logical completion based off of the text, okay? So ratified by more than 90 countries, the Nagoya Protocol is an international agreement ensuring that indigenous communities are compensated when their agricultural resources and knowledge of wild plants and animals are utilized by agricultural corporations. Okay, so the protocol is to say that indigenous communities are compensated when agricultural corps use their information. However, the protocol has shortcomings. For example, it allows corporations to insist that their agreements with communities to conduct research on the commercial usage of communities' resources and knowledge remain confidential. So there's a confidentiality clause that causes concern. What is the concern? Therefore, some indigenous advocates express concern that the protocol may have the unintended effect of. So ultimately, by having this confidentiality, we there, there's some worry that maybe the protocol won't be followed. So let's see any answer choice which says the protocol might not be followed because of this confidentiality clause. A, diminishing the monetary reward that corporations might derive from their agreements with indigenous communities. Okay, indigenous advocates are not concerned about the monetary reward that corporations might derive, nor does confidentiality, confidentiality have any impact on diminishing the monetary reward. So we can get rid of A. B, Limiting the research that corporations conduct on the resources of the indigenous agreement communities with which they have signed agreements. Okay, again, this confidentiality thing is what we're looking for in our answer choice, that this confidentiality may inhibit the Nagoya Protocol. Is this part of the Nagoya Protocol? It's being regulated by the Nagoya Protocol, okay? Therefore, we're not getting our correct answer choice here. C, preventing the in, preventing independent observers from determining whether the agreements guarantee equitable compensation for indigenous communities. Okay, this is the goal of the Nagoya Protocol. And they are concerned in this passage that the protocol has shortcomings because it allows confidentiality agreements. Therefore, Saying that these confidentiality agreements inhibit the no-go to protocol is exactly what we're looking for. Finally, let's just make sure D doesn't have anything better than that, which really couldn't. D, discouraging indigenous communities from learning new methods for harvesting plants and animals from their corporate partners. Okay, so it's the corporate partners who are learning from indigenous communities under the Nagoya Protocol, all right, and in general. But the other thing that we want to take reference to here is that though this could possibly be plausible, Right, though there is a 
small likelihood of this being true, perhaps, is it relevant to what is being asked here? Is it relevant to the the, the situation in which confidentiality agreements violate or are a shortcoming of the Nagoya Protocol? No, unrelated. So therefore, the only answer choice which answers the question um, and is considerate of the text is C. Okay, so we have our final logical completion, logical inference question, and our final question on the reading section for module two, question 14 here. So which choice logically completes the text? All right, let's read the text. The domestic sweet potato descends from a wild plant native to South America. It also populates the Polynesian islands, where evidence confirms that native Hawaiians and other indigenous groups were cultivating the plant centuries before seafaring first occurred over the thousands of miles of ocean separating them from South America. Um, to explain how the sweet potato was first introduced in Polynesia, botanist Pablo Munoz Rodriguez and colleagues analyzed the DNA of numerous varieties of the plant, concluding that Polynesian varieties diverged from South American ones over 100,000 years ago. Given that Polynesia was peopled only in the last 3,000 years, the team concluded, okay, so what we're saying here is that we are seeing that sweet potatoes are native to South America, but arrived in Polynesia 100,000 years ago at the latest. They diverged from the species in South America at least 100,000 years ago. And we are seeing that Polynesia has only been peopled for the last 3,000 years. Therefore, we can assume that the South American wild sweet potato which was domesticated in the Polynesian islands, arrived prior to people. And if it arrived prior to people, people likely did not do any have any role in that. Okay, so A, the cultivation of the sweet potato in Polynesia likely predates its cultivation in South America. So cultivation in South America isn't referred to in the text whatsoever, so we cannot make any inference based off of that. Don't pull any baggage distractors either if you happen to be an expert on this, which... This is a little bit silly. Uh, B, Polynesian peoples likely acquired the sweet potato from South American peoples only within the last 3,000 years. All right. Um, a little bit silly in the text. There's some logical inconsistencies in the text itself, but we can get rid of this because we are seeing that the Polynesian varieties of the sweet potato, which was domesticated at some point, arrived 100,000 years ago. And in the last 3,000 years, that doesn't work. So we can get rid of B. C, human activity likely played no role in the introduction of the sweet potato in Polynesia. That sounds about right, seeing as that the sweet potato originated in Polynesia 100,000 years ago, over 100,000 years ago. And people weren't there until 3,000 years ago. So they were living there for 97,000 years, these sweet potatoes, before people started, you know, domesticating them. So therefore, C. Let's just make sure D doesn't have anything good. Polynesian sweet potato varieties likely descend from a single South American variety that was domesticated, not wild. Again, we're not seeing that in the text, so we can get rid of it. And with that, we end our reading section. Okay, here we are having moved on to the writing portion of module two here on test 393. So starting off, we get a verb tense question here, question 15. Let's see if we can see where our tense is. Uh, we always want to find elsewhere in the passage where it gives away our tense. So atoms in synchrotron, a type of circular particle accelerator, Travel faster and faster until they blank a desired energy level, at which point they are diverted to collide with a target, smashing the atoms. So we have travel. I travel. That's present tense. Faster and faster doesn't really exactly have to do with tense, but it still it shows that we're still in the same tense. So we are looking for just the present tense here for the travel. So 
which of our answer choices puts us in the present tense B, reach. All right, now let's find which answer choices that you maybe chose and why they're wrong. So will reach would work, kind of, except we already have travel establishing that we are in the normal present tense, that we do not need to move into the kind of hypothetical that will gives us. Um, the, the future progressive, we would call it. So we can get rid of A. C, had reached, puts us in a past tense, right? A particular type of past tense, the past perfect, meaning it had happened in the past and it's fully done. But this is something that continues to happen anytime you put atoms in a synchroton, which continues to this day. And D, our reaching also has to do with the future. So, um, or present, right? They are reaching it in the present, but it's in a present that simply exists right in that moment. Okay, so it's ongoing, whereas this B is the simple present, which is what we want. Therefore, 15B. Yeah. Good job, man. So for question 16 here on module two, we have another verb tense question. Let's see what tense we are in. So former first lady of the United States and Indian activists were instrumental in drafting the United States Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so that's the first part of the sentence that takes place in the past. Absolutely. However, what we want to focus on is here, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a document that continues to exist, right? If something exists right in the moment, we're going to place it in our present tense. Since we want it in the present tense, we're going to get rid of have outlined, which means that it is a document that has ceased outlining things, or were outlining, which also means that it's over and done with. But the document still gives an outline of basic freedoms. So now we have outlines versus outline. All right. Um, <clears throat> We would use outline if it was more than one document, right? Documents that outline the basic freedoms. But we only have one document. We have a document. We can see that article A there is showing that we are in the singular. So therefore, outlines is our present tense and singular in agreement with document. Okay, so with 17 here on module two, we have a punctuation question. Um, let's take a look at this. Uh, first off, rockfish, you can go catch those out here in the coast of San Diego if you go fishing. Caught in all these. Uh, the lifespans of rockfish vary greatly by species, irrelevant as another sentence. For instance, the colorful calico rockfish can survive for a little over a decade while the rough eye rockfish boasts a maximum lifespan of about two centuries. Okay, so we have while. This is a subordinating conjunction, okay? Therefore, how do we connect, or therefore, because it is a subordinating conjunction, we have a dependent clause. How do we connect an independent clause right here to decade, to a dependent clause from while to centuries? We use just a comma. Notice that B and C both do the exact same things. Semicolon and a period between two clauses is the same thing, right? Um, it means that we have two independent clauses. So how could you decide between B and C is what I would ask. And then A suggests an elaboration, which means it's not, it's, uh, not essential. However, we're showing the variedness, so we need it both. We need it all. Therefore, our answer is D. Dependent clause and independent clause combined with just a comma. Okay, so question 18 is asking us to consider, do we have a non-essential phrase anywhere in here? Or is this whole first part of the second sentence an essential clause? So, powered with energy collected by solar panels during the day, the blinking LEDs keep lions away at night, thus protecting the livestock without risking harm to the endangered lions. Okay, so 
We have an option here, which puts a non-essential phrase there, which would say powered with energy, the blinking LEDs, okay? We need to know how it's powered. Let me get rid of. We have the same with A, we need to know how it's powered. So now we're between B and C, we've gotten rid of the ones with suggesting that we have a non-essential phrase here, which we don't, we, we need everything. Um, B doesn't have a comma at the end of the um, dependent clause here, but C does. We ever want to connect a dependent clause to uh, the rest of a sentence, right? We need a comma. Therefore, we're going to go with C. So 19, we have a punctuation question here. Ultimately, we are being asked, is this portion of the sentence an independent clause or a dependent clause? So let's look at this. We have, is <clears throat> material scientist so-and-so and her colleagues believe they can improve on the multi-component alloy N NiCOCr, an equal proportions mixture of nickel, cobalt, and chromium, by replacing chromium with ruthenium. Okay, that is our first clause. Everything before that is our first clause or our first sentence. Now, we have the next thing, but the alloy that resulted, nicoru, turned out to be an unsuitable replacement for nicocro. Okay, so. Um, C is incorrect because we have just a comma. That means what comes after would need to be a dependent clause, but we have an independent clause. How do we connect two independent clauses? We use either a comma and a fanboys, like we see in D, comma, then our coordinating conjunction fanboy, this time the word but, or we can use a semicolon or just a period. We're not given those options. And but is also serving as like a transition here. So C is just the comma, creating a comma splice. B is just the coordinating conjunction, which creates a run on. And A does no attempt at connecting them whatsoever, which also is a run on. Therefore, our answer is D. So for question 20, we have another question asking us to connect couple different clauses, all right? So we're going to just start here since you already did this question. This is the sentence that's relevant. But when you're doing this question on your own, I want us reading the whole thing. Archaeologist Leila Naimi recently traveled to Hegra to study its ancient tombs. Built into the rocky outcrops of a vast desert, these burial chambers seem to blendlessly... These chambers seem to blend seamlessly with nature, okay? So... I want to show us why B is wrong, all right? Because B reads fine until we get to right here. Archaeologist Leila Nimi recently traveled to Hagra to study its ancient tombs built into the, into the rocky outcrops of a vast desert, right? Or D. These both sound pretty good to our ear until we see we have this clause right here that needs to be connected on its own to a clause starting with the word built. Therefore, we need two independent clauses or a complex or a compound sentence, complex sentence separated from a sentence that's just an independent clause. How can we do that? We can either use a period or just a semicolon or a comma and fanboys. We have a fanboys here, but there's no comma, right? Seeing as that there's no comma, can't work here. We have just a comma, and B, we have nothing. So therefore, A is our only option, which is po possibly works, connecting independent clauses with a period, a semicolon, or a comma, and fanboys. Okay, so with 21, we have a question that's asking us whether we have a non-essential phrase, or multiple clauses or anything like that. It's really a punctuation question, okay? So I'm just gonna show us why some of these are wrong and what could make them right, all right? C is wrong because we're creating a non-essential phrase with aluminum oxide. Now, what would we need to change for that to work? 
the chemical would need to be a chemical. If it's an A chemical, then A chemical would be the subject. And aluminum oxide would be a non-essential but nice addition. However, since we do have the, the chemical compound aluminum oxide in full is the subject. So we cannot separate it out. Same goes for A. By separating the compound from the aluminum oxide, we're changing the subject of the sentence. Now we're between B and D here. What are the differences between these two? So recently, engineer Erica Freeberg used the chemical compound aluminum dioxide to make a grassy solid, blah, blah, blah. That comma would be necessary if we were connecting a dependent clause to an independent clause, or we were having a list or what have you. But we're not doing any of those things. So I want us to remember that if we hear a pause, our intuition would suggest that we need a comma. And sometimes that's totally correct. But before you go with just your intuition, remember to be systematic as well. What are the roles of commas? And if there's no role for the comma there, if it's not separating clauses or a dependent from an independent clause or an independent clause from an independent clause with a fanboy, if it's not creating a list, if it's not working to include a phrase or you know, transitional adverb or something like that. If it has no role, it doesn't belong there. So our answer must be D. Okay, so for question 22 here, we have a transitions question. So this is one of those ones where we really need to see the whole context of the, the passage, though we need that for pretty much every question as well. But this one, the context is incredibly important because our first goal is to see what are we pivoting between? And we need to see, we want to think, what kind of category of pivot are we doing? I don't want us just plugging in and playing each of our answer choices. When we do that, we're liable to fall for a trap where something kind of works. But what we really want is to say, what is the relationship here? And what kind of word conveys that specific relationship? So etched into Peru's Nazca Desert are line drawings so large they can only be fully seen from high above. Archaeologists have known of the lines since the 1920s, when a researcher spotted some from a nearby hill, and they have been studying the markings ever since. Okay, so we have time here, right? So likely our answer is going to need to consider time. Blank, archaeologists' efforts are aided by drones that capture high-resolution aerial photographs of the lines. So we want something temporal. I'm looking for something like now. A word like now would be perfect here. So currently and now are basically the same, right? Today. Today. Now. Currently. These are all in the same category that we're looking for. In comparison, compares and would maybe be fine if this didn't exist, but it does exist. So we have to stick with time. Still also has to do with time, but suggests a continuity or a sameness. Whereas the currently or today suggests that it's different today. And however is a pivot, but we're looking for something like a time. So therefore the only answer that makes sense is A. Just like question 22, we have a transitions question here for question 23 of module two. With transitions, I don't want us just plugging in each answer choice and seeing if they work. I want us seeing the context, seeing what relationship we have here. This is a really easy one to get correct if you know what you're looking for, but it's also one that you can easily make a mistake on. I'm going to show you the key. That word there, first, is our big key to get this right. So, first, the gold artifacts inside the ship suggest that the person buried with them was a wealthy and respected leader. So that's the first example showing why Sutton Hoo seems to be the burial site of a king, okay? Next, or additionally, secondly, the massive efforts required to bury the ship would likely have only been uh, undertaken for a king. So second, first, second, okay? First this, second this. These are just a listing of examples that support the claim up here. Okay, one, it shows how important 
context is to understanding transitions questions. If you're missing these transitions questions with frequency, you're probably not paying enough attention to the context. Um, secondly, it you know, shows that sometimes they're a little more straightforward than you might expect. First, second. Now, every time we see first doesn't mean that the next one is going to be second. But here, these are just two examples explaining the claim. So just keep the same parallel structure. So the 24 here, we have another transitions question. Again, the most important thing we have to make sense of these is context. Um, and we want to be thinking not, oh, what can I plug in here that works? But rather, what kind of category am I looking for? What category of a transition am I looking for? So the more diverse and wide ranging an animal's behaviors, the larger and more energy demanding that animal's brain tends to be. From an evolutionary perspective, animals that perform only basic actions should allocate fewer resources to growing and maintaining brain tissue. Okay, so this is a therefore type context, all right? We are looking for something that proves, we are saying, therefore, as proven, blank. Right? It builds consequence, okay? So subsequently, sometimes we think of that as a consequence word. But subsequently is actually saying next, right? First, this happens. Subsequently, that happens. Now, there's usually some sort of cause and effect idea that also is there, but not sufficient. Besides is to say next to or to say to give an additional thing. And nevertheless is a pivot word like however or yet. Thus... Just like a word like therefore is exactly what we're looking for. It perfectly fulfills the type of transition we are looking for in this context. All right, one final transition question here on module two, question 25. We are looking for meaning and context in order to determine what kind of category of a transition we are using. I don't want us just plugging and playing each transition word. I want us finding the kind of word we want, the meaning of the word we want. So when designing costumes for film, American artist Sudiart Lara Laurb uh, typically custom fits the garments to each actor. For the film Sunshine, in which astronauts must reignite a dying sun, she designed a golden spacesuit and had a factory produce it in a few standard sizes. Okay, so... This is not custom fit. These are different ideas. So typically it's custom fit. But in this example, we have lacking a tailor-made quality, right? It's standardized. So what we need here is a pivot, right? We want a pivot word. What are our pivot words? However, yet, nevertheless, but. So let's see if we have any of those. There's nevertheless, all right? So we have our pivot word. Okay. If you chose a word like thus, that makes sense if you didn't get the whole context. If you didn't read this whole thing, a word like thus sounds good. Typically, she does this. Thus, she did it. But she didn't do it. She did the opposite of what she normally does. Likewise and moreover are equally wrong. Likewise is a lot like thus. And moreover suggests something more or additional. So those three are reasons, have each have reasons we can get rid of it. And nevertheless, is the exact kind of category of pivot that we're looking for. Always find the meaning for these transition passages. If you find the meaning of the passage, you're going to find what kind of category of transition you want to throw in there. Okay, so for question 26 here, we have the first of our rhetorical synthesis questions. One of the last two questions here in module two. If you're missing these kind of questions, I give a lot of in, insight uh, on module one's version of these questions. So go look at 26, 27, 25, that sort of range on module one, if you consistently miss these. But the thing I'll emphasize time and again is you're looking for, that. you're not looking to summarize the notes, you are looking to ignore all superfluous information. What does superfluous mean? Extra unnecessary information, okay? so. 
This, more than any other question on the test, really the only question on the test, I want us really looking at the question first rather than the passage, is these rhetorical synthesis notes questions. So we want to emphasize a similarity between the two books by Sean Tan, right? So we just want to find a similarity between the two books. Anything else is extra. So what are the two books? Tales from Outer Suburbia and Tales from the Inner City. What do they both do? They both describe surreal events in otherwise ordinary settings, all right? So we want an answer choice that says, Tales from Suburbia and Tales from the Inner City make sur write surreal stories about their respective settings. So A is wrong because we do not hear Tales from the Inner City, how it's similar to Tales from Outer Suburbia. We hear a description of the outer suburbia, but we're lacking a description of the inner city. B says that both of them were published, but we hear no similarity about the content, okay? It does be similar to every single book ever published. That's enough to be a similarity. C, we're looking at a difference, okay? So that's exactly the opposite we're looking for. We want a similarity. D, we hear ordinary setting, surreal events. That's the similarity between the two. That word both describe is really good. Therefore, we go D. Make sure you're just ignoring any extra information for these questions. Okay, so our final question here on module two, question 27, another rhetorical synthesis question. These questions, I want us really looking at the question first before the passage. I don't want us doing that really any other question on the test, but this question type, that's really important. Why? because they are asking us to ignore any irrelevant quote-unquote information. We're not being asked to summarize or understand the topic or the notes. What we really want to do is just say, what does the student think is important? And how can I emphasize that one particular thing? So in this case, the aim of the research study is all we're looking for. So factors that affect clutch size have been well studied in birds, but not in lizards. Okay. A team led by Sherry Mary, Shai Mary of Tel Aviv University investigated which factors influence lizard clutch size. Okay, so the aim is to find what factors influence lizard clutch size. Next, we have the methodology. They obtained clutch size and habitat data from all these different species. Next, we have a conclusion or a result rather. Large clutch size was associated with environments in higher latitudes that have more seasonal change. And finally, after those results, we have a kind of broader conclusion. Lizards in high altitude environments may lay larger clutches because of shorter favorable conditions. Therefore, we only want an answer that has this pink highlight. So let's go through. A. Research wanted to know which factors influence clutch size. So the aim was to check about clutch size because they hadn't been studied in other birds. All right, it has pink. So, so far I'm liking A, but let's see if any of these others have a pink. After they obtained data for over 3,900 lizard species, they determined blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it focuses on results and methodology. C, as well, we are focused on conclusions and results. And D is focused only on methodology. The aim of the study, the only one that focuses only on the aim of the study, or actually includes the aim of the study at all, it's going to be answer choice A. And with that, we come to the end of test 393.